Welcome to the Inspiration North podcast, inspiring stories from inspirational people and how they found their passion, their true north. I'm James Eaves. And I'm Michelle Minikin. And this is the Inspiration North podcast. Today's episode, The World is a Friendly Place with Matt and Reese from a scene from the sidecar. We talk about holding the Guinness World Record for the longest journey by scooter and sidecar, the trials and tribulations of their amazing journey around the world, relying on the kindness of strangers, and Reese eventually tells us the punchline of his US border story. Matt and Reese are the first people to ever circumnavigate the globe on a scooter with a sidecar. Having never sat in a sidecar and with zero experience of mechanics or overland travel, Matt and Reese took on a 34,000 mile journey through some of the world's toughest environments, including a minus 40 degrees centigrade Siberian winter. The journey raised money and awareness for modern slavery charities around the world. The pair are now working on a short film and book that tells the stories of the people that carried them around the planet. We are in Inspiration North headquarters, and we're going to go back in time a little bit to Banbury in Oxfordshire to a chemistry lesson in secondary school. Is that right? Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> secondary <laughs> ways. Yeah, I guess so. That's where we sort of met to a degree, really. I guess where our friendship flourished <laughs> over... over the periodic table. Yeah, over the yeah. Periodic or something. Table, or was yeah. it something else? Yeah. <laughs> well, working out the lineup for the weekend was really <laughs> pressing. So. Yeah. We went to school together in secondary school. Didn't really probably chat for the first three or four years. And then we're in science and we're both playing for the same football club, Mm -hmm. Deddington Colts, um, under 16s or whatever it was at the time. Give them a plug. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And um, (laughs) our science lessons were pretty much us just jotting down the team sheet ready for the weekend, working out what formation was going to be used. Mm. Um, obviously, you know, we, you know, we would never have a say. Um, that was a manager's shop, but, <laughs> you know, we knew better. So, um, and from there, here we are now. Here we are now. And it's been <laughs> and quite the road. <laughs> well, thank you ever so much for coming down to talk to us. Yeah. <laughs> if you want to get in touch. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, no, we missed a bit. <laughs> yeah. Well, that was a kind of our platform for doing stupid stuff because I think that's where we became stupid in many ways. Stopped learning, started mm-hmm. concentrating on silly things in classes, and um, any dreams of a you know a normal career went out the window. And we uh, yeah started cooking up silly ideas. So from that point, we were doing silly stuff in charity from that from that age. Really, um, I think the next thing we did was shave our heads for a fundraiser. That was kind of our opening and we got a buzz of doing these silly things yes. um and it looked awful as well yeah it, it looked terrible i won't shave my head again <laughs> <time soon. laughs> um but yes yeah, so we shaved our heads once that was in, yeah, was in year 11 um and from then yeah we continued doing silly things that for i suppose good causes mm. um and then nine times out of ten we had plans that we just never really followed through with yeah um which was yeah a variation of ideas we and kind of family members and that sort of thing were never really too I suppose when everybody thought of an idea it was kind of a sure that that's sure you will yeah, kind of thing right. yeah. um, our biggest if you like disaster we tried to start a volunteer tourism agency wow <laughs> <laughs> yeah that went that went horribly yeah um, yeah it did we had all we've had we've had all these crazy ideas and silly things we've done over the years and lots of them never happened and then this one thing kind of just stuck and we actually did go around the world on a scooter with a sidecar, yeah. So mm-hmm. <laughs> um, yesterday, actually, we got the confirmation from Guinness that we are the record holders for the longest journey by scooter and sidecar. Congratulations. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So. Extremely niche. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you're going to get a record, you've got to yeah, get a niche. Yeah, yeah. It was, yeah, it was, we didn't actually find out, did we? Just You just logged on to the Guinness World Record website, yeah. and it just said the current record is... 54,962 kilometres. Mm-hmm. And then we were just like, oh, wait a minute. Th- yesterday it said 8,000 kilometres. Yeah. So mm. that must be us. <laughs> so, Brilliant. Yeah, it was it quite was. cool. Yeah. yeah. We were having a 
proper whinge. We did. We went to France in the summer holidays, and we had four thousand three hundred twenty-one kilometers in a very nice Volvo, um, very comfortable, heated seats, and everything, <laughs> air conditioning. And we we're like, oh, that was a big journey. <laughs> Nothing compared, you guys. <laughs> yeah, it was a long way, but it's not too dissimilar. You know, you just keep mm. driving every day. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of the way people I saw describe people is. You know Forrest Gump mm-hmm. when he goes for that run. Yep. Yes. And he just goes to the end of his he road. Just felt like running. And then he goes into town. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of what it is. We just went to Paris. Yep. And then we went to Greece. Yep. And then we went to Egypt and we thought, well, we're going to Cape <laughs> Town. <laughs> and then we were like, well, around the world. <laughs> so, yeah. so, so you're sitting in your dingy flat mm, in North London. Yeah. Mm. So where did this idea come from? Well, um, it all kind of came out of actually the European migrant crisis, didn't it? And mm-hmm. there was a, the Calais jungle thing mm-hmm. was going on at the time. And there was all this really nasty news, all these headlines about painting people in the, in the same brush and mm-hmm. putting people in a bad light just because they're from different countries and all this kind of stuff about controlling our borders and things in the news. And we just thought, let's just tell some normal stories mm-hmm. of people from around the world mm-hmm. and let's just just remind everyone that we're all human and people are nice and that kind of thing and really find out if they are nice or not (laughs) so we thought we'd do something that was really stupid we'd show off as we always have Mm -hmm. and see if that would make people look at us and then we would go around the world and sort of collect these stories and the idea was if we did something that we were completely ill-equipped to do we would never be able to achieve it Mm. without the help and kindness of strangers yeah then we'd be able to get the stories of people helping Mm. us um, and that kind of played out quite nicely in the end. People did help us. So. Yeah, it's probably one thing that we were, could probably say now. Well, yeah, they did. Yeah, so. yeah. But I mean, at the time, we were uh, both yeah, in a dingy North London flat. Our routine was I was pushing tables, Matt was working as a, a job, and I guess nine, nine times out of ten, we'd have our evenings sort of playing FIFA, drinking beers, and then going down to a local nightclub to yeah. have a dance mm-hmm. and then yeah. back and you know a really just typical circle of life just after finishing university not mm-hmm. too sure what you wanted to do so mm-hmm. yeah. I guess for us personally it was just sort of like well yeah it's kind of why not do something a bit different and we had the mm-hmm. opportunity as well we didn't have any big responsibilities or mm-hmm. anything and we That's just fun. thought let's do something crazy so we were looked on Gumtree and there was four whiteboards for sale at an engineering firm down the road that was closing. So we just went and bought them and we turned our <laughs> living room into a mind map. Our other flatmate, John, was not pleased about it. What was going on? <laughs> he wasn't pleased, yeah. but he used to leave the heating on every single evening. Uh, yeah, and I, I don't want to bring the story up. But, <laughs> <laughs> but if you're listening, John. <laughs> yeah. listen, John. <laughs> but me and Matt were best friends and it was just the three of us. Mm-hmm. And every evening, about two in the morning, I'd wake up and the heating was on. So I said to Matt, me and Matt alone, do you keep leaving the heating on at night? And he said, no. I said, okay, well, I believe you. So it must be John. And so <laughs> I just I said, I can't ask John. I have to do it as a collective as we're all together. Mm-hmm. So I said, guys, is anyone leaving the heating on? And Matt went, no, mate, not me. And John was um, John was American. And he just went, not me, man. <laughs> I know it's you, John. <laughs> yeah, it's John. Oh, it's a secret heating yeah. yeah, runner. Exactly, We've yeah. got one of them in our house. Yeah. So. So, but the white balls were punishment for that, really. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we thought we should kid it out. <laughs> so, so we filled these white balls up with ideas. We had going around the world in a Flintstones car. I was going to run to every country on the planet and Jesus. all these crazy mm-hmm. ideas. Mm-hmm. And I'm so pleased that we didn't do most of them. Um, and yeah, we, we, we just landed on the scooter and sidecar thing. We thought it was funny, quirky, no one had ever done it, so we thought it would be fun to be the first people to do something. And yeah, it just stuck, didn't it? It did. I think I think the really reason we liked the idea was because we had zero experience with anything that we were going to sort of bite off. So we'd never driven a motorcycle before, <laughs> or, or I suppose we had on like a, a trip to Thailand yeah. sort of mm-hmm. thing. Um, but so, I mean, the idea, if you asked me five years before that, touching a motorcycle I'd be like, absolutely no way you've got a deaf wish you think I'm going to be one of them mm. um, so it was just a whole notion of literally starting from scratch learning to ride a motorcycle and then learning to ride a motorcycle with a sidecar which is a completely different entity <laughs> in itself <laughs> yeah. um, and then yeah driving it around the world it yeah. seemed quite difficult to do and everything associated with it as well mechanics new absolutely nothing I mean Reese literally learned what a spanner was I think a few weeks before we left on the trip that, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. genuinely yeah. <laughs> our, our first breakdown was um, this is t- jumping forward I can go back in a minute but mm. our first breakdown was literally we were in the middle of the Sahara Desert 
and um, our bearing failed on mm. our sidecar wheel. And there's a video of us being like holding part of the bearing, being like, "What is this? It can't, it can't be a bearing. <laughs> that just doesn't look like it." Yeah. And it was just so obviously worse. So <laughs> yeah. nothing at all. But that was the fun of it, really. Yeah. Mm. Um, but so yeah, so we basically once we decided we were going to do it, and based on the fact we'd probably had a series of failures beforehand, mm. this one was the one we were like, right, well, regardless if it's a good idea or a bad idea, we're just going to do it because we just need to get something done, sort mm. of get to the end of something. Mm. And, be you know be able to complete it so yeah from then for about two years really we were planning fundraising trying to find sponsorship and all that stuff mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that was i think we probably did 90 percent of the work we did in those two years we probably now can say it was completely and utterly irrelevant mm-hmm. but you've kind of got to do that i thought that 10 percent there might be yeah. 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 yeah yeah but that was part of the buzz as well like getting the sponsorship and stuff mm. the buzz you get from when you when you land the sponsorship deal for something mm. like that i mean we were just through the roof excited yeah. at the time how did you yeah. go around doing that it's just like we're just gonna, we've got this wonderful idea yeah i mean it was pretty imagine getting that email hi i want to be the first person to ever go around this world in a scooter and sidecar i've never ridden a sidecar before <laughs> and i've got no idea of mechanics and i don't have a motorbike license but will you give me maybe 50 grand to do it please mm. <laughs> yeah but, but to be fair i mean they have this sort of um rule and they, they usually say when you go on a sponsorship you get 999 uh, no's and then eventually you'll get yes mm. and mm-hmm. we always say well you actually get 999 no's and then you get another no <laughs> <laughs> so there needs to be a bit more tact about how you sort of go about it we got lucky with some things as well like Matt got really lucky with our actual motorcycle training mm-hmm. before we actually had applied for any sponsorship whatsoever you just walked into a motorcycle dealership in town and mm-hmm. walked out with our motorcycle training for free it was bizarre yeah, yeah well I called him up actually and it Basically, I, r- I rang them up and it, w- it was a guy called Chris Spinks. Mm-hmm. And it turned out that he trained the team from the long way around, you know, like Charlie Borman, Ewan McGregor mm-hmm. thing. Mm-hmm. So he loved yeah. motorcycle adventures. And he was just like, yeah, I'll sponsor you it straight away. And it was like my second call. So, mm-hmm. yeah, we were completely buzzed. And then we failed miserably mm-hmm. on our tests and we really let him down in hindsight. Yeah, so we, we failed. <laughs> yeah. So this whole notion of going around the world would just seem further and further yeah. away. Yeah. And we'd been going around in circles for about a year trying to plan it and we just weren't getting anywhere. So then we just kind of thought, well, to get sponsorship and make people be serious, think we're serious, we need to do something first to prove mm-hmm. that we're, we're going to mm-hmm. do it. Mm-hmm. So we thought, what can we do that's within our sort of um, realms, if you like? And we concluded we would go from London to Land's End to John O'Groats and back to London again mm-hmm. on our 125cc learner bikes with our L-plates on, mm-hmm. but only A-roads. And we also <laughs> did it in mid-December. mid-December yeah. So we just thought, if we do it, people do it all the time, but yeah. normally does it mid-winter, because no. why on earth would you? It's a really stupid thing to do. Yeah. <laughs> Um, it, it was one of the most miserable things I've ever done in my life. I was literally <laughs> my granddad's hand-me-down leather jacket, and it was <laughs> absolutely nailing it down with rain for two weeks. Yeah, mm. cold yeah. and icy, and fell off a, a time or two. Yeah. It was just it was a horrific thing to do, but it worked basically. Mm. So then, uh, Flight Center, who did sponsor the trip, Reese was working there at the time, and mm-hmm. like a head of sales, or whatever, emailed him and said, "I didn't know you were out of the office to." Um, go and kill yourself on the Scotty, Scottish mountain passes. Mm-hmm. Do you want to um, see how we can support you? And mm-hmm. you have to come and have a chat about it. So that's how we ended up getting sponsorship, really. Mm. Uh, weird and wonderful way of getting it. But, yeah. Bizarre. We were literally yeah, in, a, in a random car, Halford car park in Burnley with broken bikes. Like, for God's <laughs> sake, this is, why are we doing this? Mm. And then this, the email came through being like, didn't know you were doing this. And then we, so we were like, oh, well, this has worked out. Mm-hmm. Yeah, 999 yeah. no's and then another no. Then drive London, Lands End, John O'Groats, and back to London again midwinter. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's how you get sponsorship. Do <laughs> <laughs> yeah. something a bit bonkers. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> um, so that, yes, yeah, so we did that. And then as a result of doing that, we passed our tests. Mm. So that was, that was good. Congratulations. Um, yeah. Thanks. It was um, actually, we didn't tell the story of when we actually took our first tests. Um, you basically, with motorcycle training, you have a module one and a module two. Module one is essentially just going around a car park, slow speed control, that mm-hmm. sort of stuff, and emergency stop. Matt <laughs> failed his emergency stop miserably by completely mm-hmm. forgetting he had a back brake yeah. and going firmly on the front brake mm-hmm. and just the whole bike doing a massive endo up in the air yeah. and then crashing back down. <laughs> and, the ex- and the examiner was just like, Thank you. If you'd like to now leave the training facility, never yeah. darken our doors again. Oh, yeah, it was flamboyant. I'll give you that. But it, 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 I stopped where I needed to. 
So it's like you, you could then get a part in a Tom Cruise movie, yeah. Like, yeah, doing yeah. stunt riding where you just <laughs> exactly. finish on a sixpence on the front wheel. And... I've honestly, never seen anything like it. And me, me, me and my, me and the examiner, our, our trainer, were watching from the sidelines, and we were just like, "Oh my god, what's he done?" <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I thought the same. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so there it is. We, we then we eventually got prepared and all that kind of stuff, mm. and yeah, it, it came around. We had to set a date because we had sponsorship, and mm-hmm. then we had to get ready for that date and left. How, I mean, you go on, sir. I was going to say, how do you then plan your route, or is it the case that you mm. just you we, just roll with it and see where you get to? Yeah, we, well, we kind of knew where we wanted to go, but even before we left, no, probably about two weeks before we left, we concluded we'd go south first oh. rather than. Um, east so we couldn't quite work out which way we'd do it um and then yeah we just basically i think it was we eventually thought we'd better look at the weather seasons because we still hadn't done that two weeks before either mm. and we kind of realized had we gone east we'd have pretty much been snookered by cold weather in the Himala- himalayas sort of thing. Mm. So, there's a, a lot to think about when you do that yeah. kind of stuff mm. and it, yeah, I'd advise anyone to think about it before you go. <laughs> <laughs> we just got lucky and yeah, and, yeah cold. Mm. <laughs> but I mean, yeah, we did try and think about it. We yeah. just, you know, mm. you can't think of everything. No, you know, like weather seasons. <laughs> we had lots yes. of challenges because no one had ever done this before. You can't just go and buy a scooter and sidecar either. Mm. So that was a big challenge to get a vehicle. Mm. Yeah, um, it, and, yeah. It was kind of good though because we got a sponsorship on board, and had we not got that, we probably would still be planning now because mm. they they kind of. Mm. Forced to it to set a date. Do yeah, they, they were sort of like, okay, well, we'll, we'll, I'm going to try and push this sponsorship through for you, but mm. when are you going? And we were like, soon. <laughs> and they were like, well, that doesn't really work. <laughs> for us. Yeah, but if you want us to get on board, we need a bit more yeah. concrete. And mm. because but we're really nice about it, because we both, like, Matt used to work for them and I worked for them at the time, Flight Center, they were sort of, um, it was, we got lucky the sponsorship in the sense that they were, it was also, they just wanted to sort of help us do it. Mm. It wasn't, it was mm. kind of like, um, yeah. It, I mean, of course, it looks good for them that they've got employees that are doing it sort of thing, but they just like the notion of sort of pushing us in the right direction a little bit, which is quite mm-hmm. nice, really. Yeah. Um, so it w- I, I think had we gone to another sponsor and been like, oh, we don't know when we're going, they'd have just laughed us out the door. But mm-hmm. they were more like... Sort You're of, trying to help these guys yeah, out. Exactly, yeah, exactly, yeah. which is quite nice. Mm. Um, so we set a date, and then when we set a date, we were still five months to go and had no scooter and no sidecar. Mm. Um, we'd approached various manufacturers um, for sidecars, and none of them really wanted to touch the idea because, mm-hmm. I mean, you can put you could put um, sidecars on scooters, but not like Vespers, and they weren't they're not really going to cut the mustard for what we wanted to do with it so mm-hmm. we had to think and we didn't want to go for like you can get maxi scooters but they're really big and it sort of takes away the charm of what a scooter actually is yeah. yep. um, so we had to f- try and find a different scooter altogether but still looked like a scooter mm. um, and we had no idea and then out of nowhere we met a guy called Charlie Prescott yeah and he was just this I think like guy in his 70s just really passionate about sidecars we'd never met him before and he just decided to take us under his wing again. He just built the sidecar for us um, with his brother Richard. Uh, wouldn't let us pay a penny, not for the parts or anything. And just said, before we left, I, I tried to give him some money. And he said, oh, no, boy, I'm just pleased to see someone from your generation not sat down watching the telly. <laughs> 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 All right, thanks, Charlie. And yeah, that was it. And we were off. So then 21st of October as we promised we Charlie saved the day and we were ready to drive off he did but they're, yeah. they're sort of um, they built it and even they I mean they recommended the scooter we got um, that, that we would go for mm. um, and even they they built this sidecar and they did a really good job with it but when we asked them you know will it last they were just like well you're just going to have to suck it in sea aren't you boy? <laughs> <laughs> that's kind of what it was like <laughs> yeah. uh, and that was, that was the fun of it, really, yeah. 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 And then it was roll on 21st of October, and we were at Ace Cafe about to leave, which was... Yeah, daunting. And still didn't have a sleep. I bought a sleeping bag on the train on the way there. It was just... Oh, yeah, the night, yeah. We bought... The day before, we were in London. Um, we'd done these... Um, as part of our charity fundraising, we'd done these sidecar tours of London, mm-hmm. and we hadn't done it yet. So <laughs> we were picking people up and dropping them off the day before on a sidecar, just taking them around London quickly. Mm-hmm. My friend had actually bought one, and his sidecar tour of London was sitting on the uh, 
A4, I think it was, or something, just <laughs> driving to in traffic at rush hour on Friday evening, driving to Ace Cafe for about two hours with me. Yeah. That's not really what he bought. But, uh, <laughs> £37.50 well spent. If you ask yeah, me. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Sat in a really yeah. cramped sidecar. <laughs> but Matt was, at that point, trying to get our sleeping bags. We still hadn't bought them. Mm. And at about two, about two minutes to five, we were also purchasing our travel insurance, which we hadn't done. Mm. And we thought we'd missed it. And you can't buy travel insurance if you're outside of the UK. Mm. And we were about to leave and to drive around the world at seven in the morning the following morning. And Mm -hmm. all insurance companies were closed at the weekend. So we'd have been doing it without any insurance. Had had this Mm. one insurance company just not stayed open for another yeah. like minute past five, mm. which, and it's literally, they were quite keen to close, but they did it for us, to be fair. We were very ill-prepared, weren't we? <laughs> <laughs> and, we, and, we <laughs> and we were leaving in the morning, and it was we'd made a big song and dance about it, so it was our London to Paris rally against modern day slavery, and we had 65 other people come with us mm. in a big convoy and drive all the way through to Paris, which was really cool, but it did mean we had to leave in the morning. We couldn't mm. just like push it back to Monday. Yeah. So... Yeah, yeah, so we left, we went through to to Paris and and got on the way. And and that was a cool way to start it, actually, because it it gave us an opportunity to talk about why we were actually doing the trip. Mm -hmm. Um, So we were doing the trip for the tell these stories and that kind of stuff, but we thought, let's pick an issue that affects the people that inspired us to do it. So the the Calais jungle stuff and human trafficking was that. um, Mm. And it led on to modern slavery from the human trafficking angle. And we ended up meeting maybe 10 different charities around the world that fight modern slavery and human trafficking and mm. then fundraise for them as, as we went. So mm. it worked quite nicely. Yeah. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah. But so basically, yeah, we were 65 people came with us from London to Paris and then they all left about two days later and we just started crying. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Genuinely. <laughs> That's the reality. This is it. <laughs> Genuinely. Do you and me, Matt? No. <laughs> we'll share the pictures when you put the podcast out, but Reese had some really blurry eyes. Well, you're just eventually just dawning that you, know, you can't turn back. <laughs> yeah. You're it's wet. like, oh, crap. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Next day, really I take the Euro, t- Euro tunnels yeah. after having driven the length of Africa, the Americas, <laughs> and across Siberia in winter and it was quite a daunting prospect at that mm. moment in time. So, um, yeah. But yeah, so we took like a month to get for Europe. We knew nothing about um, sort of overland travel. And it takes a bit of time, I think, that sort of stuff, like teething problems, first mm-hmm. couple of weeks, or sort of working out. Probably some of the toughest weeks of the whole thing, really, getting the whole used to just driving every day. And mm. there's a lot of commitments, obviously. I think with these sort of trips, um, you have to think about things like sponsorship and do you really want it? Mm. Uh, because mm. you can sort of mix messages and that sort of stuff you've got to be careful of like we, we obviously were sponsored by a travel agency so we I remember we were in um albania mm-hmm. yeah, in Tirana, and um this whole idea of visiting charities we wanted to we said before we, we were going to visit a charity in every single country we'd been to and that, that's kind of the you know mm-hmm. do a story about slavery everywhere we went and suddenly we were in albania and the only charity we'd met was in france and we'd gone through about six countries by this point so we were quite frustrated by that. We obviously got this travel agency on side and we were having a seeing these cool sites. So mm. we obviously had to put out that how amazing this was, that was and we couldn't really put out on social media that, you know, we were actually not having the best time. Mm. It was actually we weren't actually having a good time. Yeah. Um, we had to sort of make out that we were absolutely loving it. <laughs> yeah. And This yeah. is so awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, uh, so awesome, but we're achieving nothing. Yeah. Not doing what we came to do. Exactly. Yeah. And and it was just sort of like and every time we, if we did put a post out being like, we're having, you know, we, this is hard or whatever, mm. you'd have someone saying, you don't know how lucky you are, mm. sort of thing. Yes. And if we did put a post out being like, oh, we're having the best time, you'd also, while you're pleasing the travel agency, you've also got some people being like, you just look like you're on a holiday. Yeah, these boys yes. are on a jolly. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Sponsored holiday. Yeah. 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 So you yeah. kind of in a, can't in a can't win, can exactly, you? Exactly, no. yeah. So <clears throat> we, we were having people basically saying we're on a jolly. So mm. when we got to Tirana, we just said, you know what, if you think we're having a jolly, we'll have a jolly yeah, for the, next, a jolly couple of, the yeah. next couple of days. We just sort of switched off and had a couple mm-hmm. of days to sort of think about how we're going to combat the fact we can't, we just realised very quickly that we just sort of oversold right, to ourselves this notion mm-hmm. that you can go and visit charities every single country because mm. some they don't exist, um, yeah. and if they do exist, they're usually doing good work to combat modern slavery rather than talking to a couple of guys going around and screwing inside cars. They're too busy. Like they're, 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 some of the restraints that these charities work under is unbelievable. So it, a lot of them don't have time. So we just mm. sort of concluded that all we can do is 
the best we can do and be happy with that. So mm. we, when we could, we'd meet a charity, and when we didn't, we wouldn't get beat up about it. Because we also knew, we, we realised that point, you know, if you run the London Marathon for Cancer Research, you don't stop halfway around and give blood, do you? Sort of thing. Yeah. So it's kind of like, mm. so we just kind of took it as we'd do it as much po- best we possibly could, and that was kind of it. So that's... Mm. Yeah. But it was a big challenge. I think we spoke to a lot of people afterwards who've done trips like this, and you go into about, there's that three-week period when you're into it, and you just do start questioning, like, what on earth am I doing here? Mm. Like, mm. You, you, It's normal kind of for, to go on holiday for maybe like three weeks, something that kind of natural. Mm-hmm. But when you've been away, push past that, you then have to sort of keep pushing past it to get for that to become your normal before mm. you start sort of um, feeling like it's okay to be on the road for this long. Because uh, how do you then break up the day? How do you split the driving? Mm. Do you decide when to leave? Is it a bit earlier? Is it? Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so we would always yeah aim to be on the road by like eight, yeah, and always get on the road by ten. <laughs> <laughs> no, we so, we sometimes got on the road quite early. We we used to have a, a, a I mean, the thing about scooting and cycling in general is that because you put a massive essentially tin can on the side of a scooter, the fuel consumption wasn't very good mm. for it. Mm. Um, so we'd we'd go for a, a tank of fuel in sort of seventy miles. So we were changing drivers ourselves. We were switching drivers the whole time, and you'd only be sat in a sidecar for an hour at tops, sort of yeah. thing. So that was fine. Um, but our days pretty much consisted of because the whole point we could have taken we took fifteen months. We could have took it. We could have took five years. Some people do, but the whole point mm-hmm. was to circumnavigate the globe on a scooter and sidecar. That mm-hmm. was mm-hmm. so it, we had to keep making progress. Mm-hmm. So our day was pretty much split to probably about a solid ten-hour driving stint, um, finishing up being rather exhausted social media posts for an hour or two and go mm. and get a bit of food from somewhere and a, and a beer and then mm. do yes. the, exactly the same thing the same the following day yeah which mm. sounds actually quite a bleak thing to do <laughs> 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 but it's not yeah, yeah. it's actually it gives you quite a lot of time to sort of you know reflect and sort of analyze mm. what you're doing and that mm. sort of stuff which is good could you talk to each other when yeah when you were driving as well at the start mm. we could um so we had comms for a while mm. we would just talk complete nonsense for so long I mean, some accents. of the conversations we <laughs> yeah. had yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah um it's just ridiculous and mm. you know singing a lot of songs and things mm. if we'd have recorded all that stuff we'd have some really good content that yeah. just <laughs> all been thrown in yeah, yeah. <laughs> thrown in a lunatic asylum maybe. yeah yeah more likely yeah. <laughs> yeah 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 it was ridiculous but people always ask us like how was that because you're constantly so close together for so long like mm. we were living in this in this box and on the sidecar together then we would camp up most nights and just be in the same tent you know mm. right next to each other the whole time mm. and we kind of developed this idea that we knew we didn't care if the other one was angry at them so there was no point in being angry at the other person because mm. neither of us cared what the other one thought in any way <laughs> so it's kind of like the same as having loads of respect for each other if you just have zero respect for somebody <laughs> <laughs> then then it really doesn't matter if they're angry yeah. Yeah. But I'm, that, I'm really kind of... annoyed with you I just don't care, don't don't care. care. I yeah. might even be pleased about that yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. and then it was just yeah. like yeah. well yeah. I may as well have a nap in the sidecar yeah. and sleep it off yeah. and then we'll go again in an hour <laughs> and that was kind of yeah but also we're very quite I think we're both quite chilled out people, so it wasn't like we ever really had arguments or yeah. anything. It's just sort of, you know, it's, it kind of worked well, I suppose, in that sense. Yeah, um, yeah after the sort of Albania thing, that sort of stuff, we eventually made it to Greece. That mm-hmm. was quite a big thing, I think, at the time, which was like, blind, we've driven a scooter and sidecar to Greece. Mm-hmm. And when we got back, some people were like, some, we had like a, a sort of a rival sort of do, and quite a few people were sort of saying like, I, I thought I had to come along because I didn't think you'd make it to Paris. <laughs> <laughs> and they meant it as well. You could tell they were like, I'm, I'm really quite, you know. So to get to Greece at that point, we were like, well, that's fair enough. We've done Europe here. Mm-hmm. And that's the first point we'd concluded that the next step was to go to Africa. Mm. Um, so we got an Airbnb in Athens and we basically had a bit of a nightmare whereby um, we had sort of the shipping out, but we'd also sorted out visiting a charity mm-hmm. called a Smile of a Child, and um, we basically thought we got told we can ship the bike on this day. That's also the day we planned to meet this charity. Mm. So we were like, uh, what, "What do we do? We haven't met a charity since France. We'll go and meet the charity, and we'll do next week. But it's not the end of the world." Mm-hmm. Um, so we met the charity, and then what happened the day after? The Paris port strikes happened, and all mm. ships got delayed for about mm-hmm. a month. So we ended up being in Athens for another month, mm. just in random Airbnb. Mm. Um, there, are, there are worse places. Yeah. Isn't there? yeah, there are worse places, yeah. But we were also, even though we had sponsors, we were on a budget, so we just sort of sat there sort of catching up and work yes. and stuff. Mm. Um, and then at that point, we just sort of, you start stewing over the fact that, you know, we've, we're sort of 
championing this idea the world's a friendly place, don't believe everything you read, and now you're about to just ship it to Cairo and mm-hmm. Egypt, Alexandria, and I mean, obviously 10 years ago, people would love to go on a holiday to Egypt and that sort of thing. These days, it's much mm-hmm. more sort of, you know, you know, sort of terrorism, ISIS and that sort of stuff. So mm-hmm. it's kind of thinking, that was when we were like, yeah, is it going to be friendly there? I hope so. Well, yeah, well, <laughs> the next two countries were Egypt and then Sudan. And all we knew about Sudan was what we'd seen in the news, that mm-hmm. all the war and stuff. And in Egypt, all we knew, you know, the recent spout of terrorism. So we were a bit like, are we going to be okay to drive the length of both of these countries in a big red mm. scooter and sidecar saying hi you know <laughs> come and find me mm. um and we were fine yeah, we were. <laughs> it was they were the most friendly places of the whole trip actually mm. um mm. it was com- it were completely incredible places to drive through i mean everyone always asks us which our favorite country was and we always say sudan yeah without, mm. uh, shadow it out always say sudan sudan was like um yeah you struggled to buy a meal it was, it was, and it's really bizarre. You you can drive through the Sahara Desert for hours on end and not see anyone, and then you just see a random man in the middle of the desert with about four to five cows mm. in a hut, and you're thinking, "How are you existing out here?" Mm. Um, mm. He's still got Facebook. Yeah. He's still got a smartphone. <laughs> yeah. That's the one thing they have got. Brilliant. But other yeah. than that, they're literally. It's like you wouldn't have changed from a thousand years ago, sort mm. of thing. Mm. That's the way they sort of live, and it's just. I think there was uh, there was one point actually we we were wild camping in um, a random farmer's um, land and sort of middle of Sudan fact we had a fire campfire going you could see the full stars and there's no light pollution or anything at mm. all and it was a Sunday evening and we were, Sudan's roughly about two hours ahead of here mm-hmm. so but we were sort of um, Sunday evening and I sort of thought back to the fact that everyone else back home on a Sunday evening is sort of sitting down preparing to go to work the next day. And I'm just in the middle of Sudan in this random field and I can hear mm. this farmer walking back singing mm. just across the road. And that's why I kind of thought it's quite a cool thing to be doing, really. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's quite an iconic moment, yeah. So, yeah, it was awesome. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> how, do you, how do you navigate, then, these different places? Because... Uh, you know, we bought a sat-nav and did mm-hmm. all that kind of stuff. Like, it, But really, we just... Use Google Maps. <laughs> it's, it's so well, there I was thinking they're looking at the stars yeah, and yeah. which where is no, where's the sun in the sky? And yeah. And yeah. You just get asking Google for directions. Maps, where the mosque is. Trying to get to uh, <laughs> trying to get to Sudan. Is it? Is it? Yeah. Keep going that yeah, way. Yeah. Yeah, just, That's it. Just keep Google. straight on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Google Maps. A lot of the countries you go to where you think it would be harder, it's actually easier because there's just like a few roads. Mm. You can't really get lost. There's like mm. two. Of we can't really go off road on the sidecar although we did a lot and it went horribly Mm -hmm. but you um yeah you kind of just stick on the tarmac and hope it takes you south really Mm. it wasn't very hard brilliant (laughs) so all the way through africa yeah we made it down through africa there were some big hiccups um big breakdowns all that stuff but we made it to cape town um and then we shipped it to santiago and chile Mm -hmm. and then we drove it all the way up to cartagena in colombia um before then going up through the states and back across russia yeah. Mm. So managed to get through the border, okay? So again, sorry, <laughs> the American border. Yeah, well, that was an interesting one, actually. <laughs> it was quite we lied to them, didn't we? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you never been allowed yeah. to go anywhere near yeah. America again. Well, what happened was is um, so we went to Sudan, mm. and Sudan is on America's list of places that if you go, you can't go on a, mm. an Esther. Yeah. Mm. Um, so we were in Cartagena in Colombia, shipping the sidecar to Mexico. Um, we had planned to ship around the Darien Gap and go to Panama and drive all the way up but um, at the time Nicaragua was literally on the brink of civil war <laughs> yeah. mm-hmm. so we were like and it, to be fair we'd known people who had gone through at this time and they kind of said that the people aren't there to harm tourists mm. um, but they are making it difficult and what they meant by difficult was they were essentially digging up the roads standing in the middle of the roads with machetes, bazookas, right. you know, bazookas. <laughs> bazookas. That's what some guy told me. He said, he, he said, I, I, I said, I pulled up and this guy had a bazooka. And I was like, I don't know if I want to see a bazooka. <laughs> I don't even know what it would look like. I heard the word bazooka. When you it's not in a sentence with bazooka, that veruca. For a very long time. That's what I was thinking too. Was, was yeah. it, isn't it Eddie Izzard's advice about bazookas? You don't run away from the person with the bazooka, you run towards them yeah. <laughs> and then just hug them. <laughs> and then the weapon's useless. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's so true. <laughs> but, but, so basically, we had had to go on Nicaragua off-road. Yep. 
And we'd just done the Lagunas route off road in mm. Bolivia, which is essentially from Chile to Bolivia, you can go two ways. You can go the sort of the tarmac route over the Andes, yep. which is, you know, the in most interesting thing you'll see is um, a fuel station, or you can go the off road trail that goes 5,000 meters, you know, above sea level, which is only 700 meters off the top of Kilimanjaro. Mm -hmm. But the views are just spectacular. So obviously, we mm -hmm. decided to do that one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we thought we'd be fine because we basically this guy said if you stick on the main road through this off-road trail, the rest is okay. Mm -hmm. What he didn't tell us is that for some reason Bolivian customs have decided to put their sort of vehicle checkpoint well off the main road on a completely different road that's much worse at the highest possible point of the whole park. Mm. So you've got to have a good vehicle to get into Bolivia. They want to really <laughs> test it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that wasn't what we had. Yeah. Um, so we ended up going to this checkpoint and we arrived there about 6 p.m. the sun was setting and we were like there's no way they're going to be open we've got about half a bottle of water and a bag of crisps because we were so underprepared we didn't quite mm -hmm. realize what we were getting ourselves in for mm. and then we just knocked on the door and they were still open and you know it just they just it was bizarre they just didn't even sort of appreciate that we'd just driven up to this <laughs> thing on a scooter and cycle it was kind of like they, we kind of like it they almost had it every single day. It was just a normal occurrence. <laughs> Two random <laughs> <laughs> British yeah. boys <laughs> would rock up and arrest They always go again. Yeah. 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 Um, we were so beat up, though, because mm. going up that high in the mountains, obviously you get altitude mm. sickness. But mm. if you're in a cycle on the bike, you don't get altitude sickness at all because you're not using any energy. You're not burning any oxygen. Yep. But then the bike suddenly needs oxygen. There's not enough oxygen for it. So we had to get out and push the bike uphill. At mm. this, and then mm. all of it floods straight out, instant feeling sick. And it's like really bad headaches and mm -hmm. horrendous place to be in that condition. It was going to be dark. It was going to be sort of minus 10, minus 15 that night. We didn't have that kind of kit. This isn't a place where we could use Google Maps. Like there was just, uh, it was mm -hmm. just, if you looked at it, there was no roads. It was just like a rocky field. Mm -hmm. And we were just like, this, we, we pushed it too far. Like, we're done. We're absolutely done for. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Call the embassy. Yeah. We need to be rescued. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we were like, "What? What do we do?" We had no idea what to do. Um, so we decided that we would just get as low as we could um, and get down to this place called the Laguna Colorado, which is a red, a red lake essentially, mm. um, and see if there was like a little house there or something, and we could maybe get rescued. So mm. we just pointed the sidecar downhill and just clung on for dear life, like real <laughs> white nickel, nickel riding. And it really was like, I mean, freezing cold, mm. really horrendously cold and bone jarring. Mm. And um, we blo broke the sidecar in three places. So three of the five joints that holds it on snapped. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we pulled up next to this red lake um, and as the sun was setting. So all the sky was deep, like red, the lake was red. And the only thing breaking it was the silhouette of the mountains in the mm -hmm. background. And it was probably like the coolest thing I've ever seen in my entire life because mm. we were just completely euphoric as well because we'd survived <laughs> the mountain. <laughs> and we pulled up to this little village and um, knocked on this person's door. And again, they were just like, oh, these guys again. Like, as if it always, it always happens. This little four year old girl just opened the door and went, no. And that was it. They didn't know. And eventually, mum and dad and grandpa, I think, came back yeah. and saved the day and took us in for the night and gave us some soup and stuff. And <laughs> it was just absolutely incredible. But, but yeah, we we were really uh, yeah. pushed it to limits. We did, yeah. So we got eventually got out of the Lagoon's route. Three of the five sidecar joints snapped. A massive chip out of the um, sidecar wheel. So mm. it was it was literally, I don't know how it didn't burst. No um, idea how yeah. we got out of there. And so we were going pillion on the bike because we knew going over one rock with too much weight would just yeah. snap the sidecar yes. wheel. Yeah. So that's why we never went round, did just a Darren Gaff, did Nicaragua because we were just thinking back to that and thought it wasn't worth it. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. we instead we shipped it to Mexico because that was the only other point you could ship up to. Mm -hmm. We did consider going down a little bit because we wanted to do it. We were at really point we didn't get to do any of Central America. We mm -hmm. really wanted to do it. Um, but we also knew when we were going around to Mexico, the boat had been delayed to Mexico. Uh, we were hunting down Russia, really. Mm -hmm. And the longer we took, the closer we were going to go into Siberian winter. Mm -hmm. So we um, went through Mexico. It's quite funny, Mexico. We, we were actually, it's one of them places as well, going back to the sort of notion of um, the world's friendly place. So I guess it's one of them places that as we were arriving, we were a bit more nervous about it. Mm. About two days before, we'd seen this article online about two cyclists who, who had essentially yeah. been found at the bottom of a mountain 
beheaded mm-hmm. um, the, <laughs> by the cartel. Yeah, yeah. and they re- the reason they found that they were beheaded by the cartel is because the bodies were laid next to their bikes, but they were laid next to opposite bikes. Mm. Mm. So that's how they, that was kind of how mm. they realised it wasn't like an accident. Yes. Um, so we were like, that's quite a scary thing to read, just as you're mm. about to drive through Mexico, and we were going to yeah. go literally the same road that they were on. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Obviously, we're absolutely fine. I mean, obviously, it's been terrible what happened to those guys, but obviously, what we also reminded ourselves was that you only hear the bad story. There are yeah. hundreds of thousands of people who are driving mm. through these places, and you never hear those stories no. because they're just not Everything interesting. was fine. Yeah, yeah exactly. Says so Mike and Karen from <laughs> Middlesbrough. Yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> you just don't they exist that. as yeah. well, yeah. <laughs> so. Robin and Kim from Plymouth, actually, were yeah. the people that told us that. <laughs> and, uh, and, and it really is. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. So, but we eventually went through... Um, got through to the Laredo border and that's where we oh yeah you were talking about the border story I don't know how we got tangent got, alert tangent. <laughs> yeah. we, got, we got there in the end yeah. Sorry. Yeah. just like your story that was like a 15 <laughs> minute tangent I completely forgot <laughs> <laughs> what is wrong with you we started off with you'd been in Sudan and you were yeah. going to lie to customers that's yeah there we go. So, there's so a thread as we were shipping round <laughs> to Mexico we had a month to, and basically I told my um, my dad and back in Sudan, I spoke to him on the phone, and he was going to go on holiday, and it would we be driving through Vegas? And we would be. Mm-hmm. And I said to him, I reckon we'll be there at this point here. <laughs> so he said, all right. So we went driving through the Sudanese desert. Um, no one could speak to us for about a week, sort of thing, as we were making the trip. Mm. And I didn't think he was going to book it. He booked it straight away. I was like, well, okay, we've got to make it then. Oh, God. Two days later, we broke down Ethiopia. We were stuck in Ethiopia for about a month. Mm. And so suddenly the plans went out the window. So I had to tell my dad when we were in South America, I'm not going to make it. I'm really sorry. But then it just so happened that when we were shipping to Mexico, um, that we had a month off because the boat was there. So I thought, well, I may as well just go and see him because he's going to be in Vegas now. It just ha- happened it was the right time. Mm. But then as I was buying my Esther, it said, you've been to Sudan, you can't get an Esther. So I was like, oh, what do mm. I do? I already booked my flights. But we had already got second passports, yeah. second British ones. Mm-hmm. So I just put the Esther on the second passport, didn't have the Sudanese stamp, and kind of hoped for the best. Mm-hmm. And when I got to... I was changing Atlanta, so I was going through customs, and I got accepted through customs. I was like, I'm, fr- I'm done it somehow, and then I was walking to the next sort of um, next terminal, and this guy said, "Sorry, mate, baggage claims there." And I said, "I haven't got any baggage," and he, and he was like, "What do you mean you haven't got any baggage?" And I was like, "I've just got this," and he was like, "Where have you come from?" I was like, "Mexico City," and he was like, "And where are you going?" Vegas, and he was like, "So you've come from Mexico, and you've only got that bag there?" And I was like, "Yeah," and he was like, "Right." <laughs> Let's get me check. Yeah, oh, no. much, yeah. <laughs> and at the bottom of this bag was my um, other passport. Other passport. Oh, and no. so I was, I was like, oh, da, 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 Jesus, <laughs> <laughs> heart was racing. And um, this, this, obviously, this guy goes, "Is this your bag, sir?" Yes. Did you pack it? Yes. So he starts getting all my clothes out and that sort of thing. And I'm mm. just, uh, he's getting close and close to his passport. Brings out the passport, and I was like, oh, that's my second passport. Trying to act all calm, and he goes. Um, he goes, what's your other nationality? They're both British. And he looked at the front page, saw it with me, and if he flicked one more page, <gasps> he'd have seen the Sudanese stamp. <laughs> You'd be in Guantanamo Bay right now. <laughs> <laughs> but he didn't. He just he'd closed. Have been in Cuba. <laughs> <laughs> he just closed the book and just gave it back to me, and I was like, blimey. Mm. So, but at that point, we knew that basically, if you, if you have two passports, I mean, I'm not. Saying, yeah, <laughs> don't catch me out of yeah. the US government, please. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You're yeah. like, I love to go back there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, so eventually we got through to Mexico, um, sorry, through to Texas. Um, but when we drove through the border in the sidecar, the actual mm. one of the border checkpoints, he said, I'm not even going to bother checking you guys. Love it. Yeah. Yeehaw! <laughs> yeah. so, um, yeah. so, it was so easy. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. Uh, yeah, we got into the States, cracked on up through the States. That's the mm. crazy place, mm. the craziest place we went to, maybe. <clears throat> tried to make it to Alaska. Uh, we didn't make it to Alaska. We uh, had a big bro breakdown. Our exhaust fell off. Um, mm. And it, uh, they're so bad when an exhaust falls yeah. off a bike because you lose your ears as well. They fall off too in the process. Yeah. It was <laughs> horrendous. It actually is. You know? <laughs> yeah, it's so <laughs> loud. It's, so it's loud. just so and loud. I just fell off on like the Seattle Highway mm. by yeah. accident. And I mean. If there was a car behind us or anything, we could have caused a serious accident. Mm. Fortunately, there wasn't. We mm. never saw that as exhaust, exhaust again either. No. <laughs> Someone nicked it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so. Uh, so we didn't make it to um, to Alaska, and then we were in Vancouver, and we needed to drive home somehow. So we wanted to be the first people to go round the world, mm-hmm. and we thought we'd go to Singapore 
and then go up through Southeast Asia and back through Iran and stuff, it'd be gorgeous. But there was a visa problem with Iran. The Iranian government had just decided that no people with a British passport could drive their own vehicle in Iran in, in any circumstances. Mm-hmm. And we really wanted to drive the, all the way around. So the only other road uh, available was the Trans-Siberian Highway. Um, yeah. Yeah, and that was quite something because it was November that we got to yeah, Vladivostok. We, we got to uh, start November and we didn't actually get the sidecar till mid-November and we knew that we were going to literally go through Siberia in the absolute middle of winter. Yeah, <laughs> so we were lucky. We were in Canada and obviously they get harsh winters so we got some good gear. We mm-hmm. we Some people would ask us, what do you go for? Do you go for like electric heated gear or do you go for the other stuff? And because our bike was so reliable, we couldn't go electric mm-hmm. because um, we had to do the, all the sort of standard sort of stuff so we've got proper expedition coats and that sort of stuff which which makes this winter an absolute breeze honestly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so um we got that and um yeah we we set off in the first couple of days it was um it was sort of mild two degrees boring long gray roads nothing. are you still camping this point, we, Not at this point. no we <laughs> had intentions to <laughs> we, we, yeah, we, we did actually we got the gear yeah. we kind of thought if we break down or something we might need it um, yeah. Yeah. but at the same time we were never going to sort of volunteer ourselves to camp in these conditions mm. yeah, yeah. Um, but it wasn't that bad first couple of days and that on the third day we woke up snow wasn't even forecast but it was literally just a winter wonderland yeah um, yeah, and we had summer tires on the bike. Couldn't get winter tires, mm-hmm. so we had no idea if we'd even move. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but we did. It moved, and we were like hurtling towards the UK at a thrilling five miles an hour. <laughs> so, oh, <laughs> this wow. huge road ahead of us, and it was we were literally sliding and skidding around the road because you just can't control it with without yeah. um, summer tires. And then we pretty much did that that for the sort of the next six weeks, all day, every day, mm. um, and temperatures slowly dropped. Apparently, the thing is, you, you have to go up, up around China, and mm. that's going to be the most remote bit up towards the, around the north of China, the most remote bit and the coldest mm. bit. And if you can get to a place called Cheetah a bit further along, then you've made it. So we were like, right, we've just got to get to Cheetah. And it did get really cold. It was like minus 30 and it's really remote. You don't see like anything for ages. People were telling us on Facebook, on the Russian guys were saying like, don't do it. You will, you will die. There's nothing out there. There's no, like nothing mm-hmm. at all. It's just mm. completely nothingness. It's not true. Mm-hmm. There's like the odd coffee shop now and again. It's like a little, sh- it's like a little <laughs> shed and someone's <laughs> living there. Right. Where it's coffee, yeah. coffee shop <laughs> hopping. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Anyway, we got round the the top and it was minus 30 and minus 30 is horrendous. And we got to Cheetah and we thought, we've nailed this, like we've a- we're actually going to get this thing home. And then we looked at a weather map and there was going to be a snap cold spike ahead of us and it was due to drop to minus 40. Mm-hmm. And sort of every time you go 10 degrees lower, it's another level of pain. Mm-hmm. And minus 40 is absolutely horrendous. I don't know if have you ever been out inside minus 40 before, guys? At a minus mm. 17, I think, in Germany. Yeah. We, mm. School was cancelled that day. <laughs> <laughs> we were like, yes! <laughs> it was too cold to play snowman. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's, no. it's, it's cold. You to go get, outside and it's, yeah. yeah. To give you an idea, there's, um, from where I'm from, there's a, there's a coffee factory and um, they have a room that is um, minus 45 degrees. And workers, even with the best gear, are not allowed to be in that room for longer than 45 minutes. Mm. And bear in mind, we were driving at minus 40 with wind chill. Mm-hmm. We were, I reckon, it was probably less than minus 45, and we were at 10, 10 hours in a day, sort of mm. thing. So yeah. it's it's nasty. But on top of the cold, I mean, you can just about handle the cold, yeah. really. Um, it was all the, it, but it was other elements. Because we were obviously on snowy, icy roads the whole time. Mm-hmm. And it's one road, the Trans-Siberian Highway. So it's where all the truckers go as well. So we just every sort of... And we can only go 20, 25 miles an hour because of the ice. And they're just ploughing it past us at 60, mm. 70 miles an hour, overtaking us. And, and you just sort of like... You know that like um, if they just overtake you at one point and we slip, we're just going to slide into the side of them. Mm-hmm. And literally as we were going, sort of every 100 kilometres, you'd see a lorry in the side of the ditch mm. because they also are not under control, really. Yeah. Yeah. And it was particularly hard, I guess, for the guy in the sidecar because we've made modifications to the bike at this point. So we tried to insulate the sidecar. We literally literally had got some insulation and put it to the sides to try mm-hmm. and keep the guy warm. Because mm-hmm. if you were riding the scooter, it wasn't actually that bad because um, you can't kind of work and to keep it on the road. Mm-hmm. Whereas the guy in the sidecar just literally just sit there. Yeah. Just sit there and it was so cold. So we had this visor dilemma whereby the 
the visor within about two to three minutes would freeze over so you couldn't see anything. Mm -hmm. And if you just left the visor up, yeah. you, you, your eyes would freeze over and you wouldn't be able to see anything. So the guy who was, to, was riding would have to ride visor up and just continually pull open his eyelashes because mm -hmm. they were freezing over. Mm -hmm. um, whereas a guy in a sidecar would just let the put the visor down just let the ice slowly go over but every time you just lift, lift open your visor you see a massive lorry wheel this close to your like an inch or two from your face just plowing past <laughs> yeah. And, Shocking snow yeah. to you. and our intercoms are gone by this point um, mm -hmm. so we couldn't even have a conversation with the guy to know if he's got it under control or not yep. um, so you just kind of sit there and hope to yeah. get to the sort mm -hmm. of um, the next part and we were sort of every sort of evening in Siberia we got to a truck stop and just were like this is just but I've never been on the brink so much mm. and thought mm. I don't know if I can actually ma make it home Yeah, mm. because it, it was out of our hands quite yeah. literally um, Yeah, and it's bizarre like when we've had other problems like the Lagunas route or we broke down Ethiopia once and we were in intense scenarios and you always look back at it and thought that was intense shouldn't do that again mm -hmm. uh, but you didn't realise at the time with, Ru with Russia and Siberia we were two weeks in and we had that realization, this is intense. And we also looked at the map and we had five more weeks of exactly the same thing mm -hmm. to keep going. Mm -hmm. And it we, how dawned on us just how dangerous and stupid the idea was really. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we were getting pretty quite de depressed about it, if I'm honest. We were like, mm -hmm. we are just, we've pushed the limits too far here. This is too stupid and we're gonna die for this ridiculous cause. Like, just to drive this thing around the world, what are we doing? Like, mm -hmm. This is really stupid. And then one day we were sat in this coffee shop and um, it was like an old container or whatever they'd turned into a coffee shop. And uh, we were sat just moaning, trying to warm up. And this guy walks in, uh, happened quite a lot actually, and he just sat opposite us and he was sipping a tea, slurping really loudly, staring at us and trying to have a conversation with us, right? And we were like, doing, being all polite, yeah, and all, doing all the Russian stuff. And, and then after about 10 minutes, we were like, dude, we're so cold here. Can you just leave us alone and try and get warm for a minute? <laughs> And um, then he pulled out his phone and he showed us our tracking app, our spot tracker. And it turned out he had come from his local town and tracked us down to just to ask if we were OK or not. Aww. Yeah, <laughs> Just to come and see if we were OK. So okay. We were. We, we had a good chat with him. But then Russian Facebook found out about us mm. through this, basically. And from that point on, in every town or village that we were going through... Guys. Yeah, yeah, there was <laughs> signs for the sidecar guys. There, there, was, there was Matt and Reese like, <clears throat> written on boards and oh. people stood there with their motorbikes and stuff. And we were staying at people's houses then all the way back um, to Moscow. And it made a huge difference because they had some really fun ways of warming us up and cheering us up and stuff. And they love vodka. Yeah. <laughs> they love their vodka. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's all we want to do is sort of welcome you in, have a quick check on the bike, make sure it's okay, any repairs needed. And after that, straight to the vodka. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, it was quite funny. We, we put up, basically, this one guy in Moscow was translating our Facebook posts into Russian Facebook. Um, but they take things a bit more literally. So mm. we put a post out one evening saying, uh, great to hang out with the guys from the Visibersk. But so hung over today vodka is just an absolute killer I'm not doing that again like when you always say I'm not drinking mm. again <laughs> but they took it literally as we were saying we're not touching vodka again and we were fed up so the next town we went to they were like no vodka honest no vodka no vodka <laughs> and then we were like oh somehow you misunderstood that but fine and then they were like no vodka but whiskey <laughs> <laughs> so, and it was horrible <laughs> <laughs> it was worse yeah. it was like fire whiskey yeah exactly and, yeah, actually they were so lovely and without their help I yeah. don't think we'd have got back mm. the bike definitely wouldn't have no. it was just horrendous but the, the the best thing about going to stay with the Russian guys was the banyas as well mm. the saun saunas because mm -hmm. a, a normal evening you would turn up get charged upon vodka and then you dive in into a sauna naked with a 70 year old man called Sergi and he would hit you with a stick and that was just a Tuesday <laughs> evening you know you could do that almost <laughs> every yeah. London, yeah. <laughs> uh, it was it was it was good fun but you know and the hangovers didn't exist really because the next morning the cold just kills it straight away yeah. and then turn up and you're ready to get back on it again it was it was yeah it was a weird trip but if we do <laughs> yeah it was but if we do talks and that sort of stuff these days mm. we, if we're ever asked like a particular section we do talk about Russia because it's um, because it was so hard for us anyway yeah. um, but also because we going back to this world friendly place I mean especially when we were looking to go that well, it was probably nearly uh, over a year ago that we were planning to sort of go to Russia mm. obviously there was a 
I mean, Russia's not really considered the friendliest place, and there's a big mm. question mark around it. And it was just a complete polar opposite. Everyone mm. was so friendly, mm. so welcoming. And there was different things as well. Like, it was even um, um, one, one evening we were staying with these um, uh, guys, and we went into a, a banya with one of them. Mm. And we were sat in a banya, and he didn't speak any English, but he's trying to make conversation. Um, and he asked us if we had girlfriends. And um, what do you call it? And we, somehow we got sort of confused, and we, we, we did at the time. I, I didn't, so Matt, and but basically he thought that we didn't or got confused somewhere on the lines. And then about five minutes later, we were back in this pub uh, bar, and he was t- he took me outside, and he, and um, I was like, this is a bit bizarre. <laughs> And um, it's and minus he, 40 outside, you don't really 40, go out. Yeah, it's just me, and, it, and, and we're, it, we're stood next to some other people as well. And he dragged me away from then, so we're quite secluded. And he goes, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And I was like, what? And he goes, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, but uh, gay? And and I was like, no, 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 we're not gay. And sort of, and he was like, okay. And at the time, I thought he was asking me if we were gay, because in Russia, it's sort of, you know, that sort of stuff is well we perceive it's frowned upon and mm-hmm. I think it is in some parts but then I realised afterwards he wasn't asking us if we were gay because he was going to be offended by it he was he was worried that he'd offended us by asking us if we had girlfriends mm-hmm. and that's what he was actually trying to get across and apologise for yeah. um, so it was just like how things are sort of perceived and yeah. sort of look is, is yeah. completely different yeah. yeah So it's interesting because your initial reaction to that was like oh my god this guy's really homophobic and I'm going to get beaten up because he thinks I'm gay <laughs> yeah. but actually, I thought, I thought yeah. he was going to like have a, like a series of rides for you. Yeah, 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 exactly. Pick one, pick yeah. one, pick yeah. one. <laughs> this is my first daughter. Yeah. <laughs> no? Okay, second daughter. Yeah. But yeah, it was just surprising. He was more so concerned about yeah. like, had he offended us or not. Yeah. Mm. The hospitality in Russia is just another level. Like mm. they're just doing everything they can to make you happy. Mm. Sometimes it can be a bit too intense, if I'm honest. <laughs> but um, yeah, it was it was a good time. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and other than that, yeah. Well, then we made it back. And then somebody had a party, <laughs> and everyone's like, we didn't think you'd get to Paris. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly, yeah. <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah. What would you say then are some of the key key lessons that, obviously, you talked about people being friendly wherever you go, with, there's this almost assumption or stereotype of certain nations, and then you actually realise what we see in the news isn't mm. isn't true. Are there any other kinds of things that really marked you during the trip i'll tell you what we, we stayed in a lot of people's houses right mm. and when you stay in someone's house you listen to their point of view more mm. than you do just normally mm. we've got this big like polarization in society at the moment and you just you get three lines of someone's opinion and then you just go like i hate that or i like you i'm blocking them yes. or whatever mm. but we were staying with, pe- with people who we completely disagree with on every like people like if you don't build the wall, I'm going to build the wall. You know, mm-hmm. those sort of people. And mm-hmm. I couldn't disagree more with their viewpoint mm-hmm. because I stayed in their house and I was with them for like full days and they were really looking after me. Mm. We had that kind of back and forth and like chatting. Mm. I think we both kind of learned a little bit more about mm. it. So mm. my my big thing, I think, is that everybody should go and just stay in random people's houses <laughs> and learn a little bit more <laughs> about each other because you, you genuinely it's, do. Yeah, it's important, I think, especially for, for like now, like, for like Brexit and all that sort of kind of thing. You just kind of realise that mm. just because you have a difference of opinion doesn't mean that they're a bad person yeah, or an really enemy. Like, yeah, yeah, it's just it, yeah. that's all it is is a difference of opinion. And at the moment, yeah. especially because of things like social media and stuff, it it sort of you know makes it tensions rise and p- mm-hmm. things get unnecessarily sort of mm. aggressive and uh, and that's so that's quite a big thing that I guess we yeah, we learn in that sense. Mm. Um, mm. And other than that, yeah, but you always say about the sort of world conveyor belt, really. I mean, it's kind of like there's a conveyor belt of human spirit out there, and if you jump on it, in a yeah. scooter sidecar or a Flintstone mm-hmm. S vehicle mm-hmm. or even just a bike or a car, mm-hmm. you will generally just be put on it, and 99.9% of the world is friendly. And that's mm-hmm. kind of what we yeah. found they out. They don't want to have bazookas. No, they don't want to have bazookas. And if they do, <laughs> they're probably not aiming it at you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they're aiming it at their barucas. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 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 So but we stupid. need to. T- that is definitely going to be a bullet point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
so um, in terms of other lessons, I mean, we learned a lot about mechanics. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we can yeah. change mm-hmm. anything on a scooter now. Well, <laughs> uh, but we can change things. I couldn't tell you what I'm changing, yeah, but I'm yeah. changing something. Yeah. Oh. Uh, yeah, so. <laughs> you know that this goes there okay, yeah. and you tighten it six times. Exactly. Or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I guess we could just be really lucky, but we if you kind of like put an idea out there, and you just keep putting it out there and out there and out there and out there. Eventually, mm. stuff just turns up and it mm. just happens. Like mm-hmm. it's the whole thing with Charlie building the sidecar, just random guy, mm-hmm. and people just saving us in loads of different stories around the world. Where you'd think there's like on the way back, we were done for in Poland. The engine blew up. There was no way we were going to be able to get home, mm-hmm. and certainly not for the date we planned for that big party. Mm. And then. This Polish guy, the Poznan Sidecar Club, as if that exists. <laughs> <laughs> it was his birthday. He had yeah. his family round. He left them at his birthday party. He drove 100 kilometers across Poland to come pick us up, <laughs> took us back to his house, put us up for the night. And then in the morning, he turned up and said, I found another engine on um, Polish gum tree. <laughs> and it's 100k away again and we'll go and pick it up for you and we'll swap it in over the weekend and it was just like that bike doesn't exist in Poland it's mm. only there because there's a scrapped one that's randomly turned up mm. and this guy's just come and done it out mm. of nowhere and that, that that's sort weird. of stuff there's loads mm. of those stories from the trip mm. whereas you just say universe can you help me here please and see what happens mm. it generally does yeah. yeah or did for us anyway yeah he did for yeah. us yeah, yeah. That's yeah. amazing. Well, we often hear it, don't we? You, yeah. you commit to doing something, you're passionate about something, and then all of a sudden these doors mm. open and the right person is on the pathway or you get an introduction to somebody and it's yeah. it's like magic, but it's... Yeah, we do about podcast guests. So, yeah. You know, you, you yeah. met this mm. one and it's like, oh, great story. We need them on the podcast. So we do that all the time, mm. collecting people. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Is there a bit of kit if you could go back you you would take if that was I know obviously very different mm. climates, different terrains. Is there anything mm. I mean I we we were talking about Swiss Army knives, don't we? But <laughs> <laughs> is there anything that's you uh, could take with you? I mean I wouldn't take a sat nav. <laughs> yeah. I never didn't use it. It was yeah. the biggest waste of money. Mm. Um <laughs> in terms of what I'd take. Well, you know, we were in a position where we just didn't know what to take, so we took everything. Mm. So yeah. it's more mm. what wouldn't we take and we mm. just chuck the kitchen sink away in Dover like, there was mm. loads of stuff we took we didn't need I mean you know I really don't think you need anything the less you mm-hmm. have the better just mm-hmm. take your passport mm-hmm. and you know a bit of money and you're done that's it yeah mm-hmm. so there wasn't really any any big bits of kit spare parts we should have taken some spare yeah. parts we, yeah our, our clutch yeah. broke just self-destructed about seven times in the trip mm-hmm. just because it wasn't used to the strain of what mm. we were putting it through mm-hmm so the first time it happened in Ethiopia, um, it was, we were in the middle of this, we were driving through Ethiopia, both had food poisoning, um, and we broke down in the middle of this big festival mm-hmm. in a random Ethiopian village, mm. um, it's called Timcat Festival, we didn't know it was going on, um, and it's basically like, um, what kind of festival is it? Think Notting Hill Carnival, yeah. but with <laughs> more tribal dance and massive sticks, yeah. and more cool. people mm-hmm. more excited. Yeah. Yeah. And then you've got a massive red scooter and cycle in the middle that they've never seen. Yeah. <laughs> and two, yeah, two random British white guys, that, that gets them very excited. <laughs> and, so, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. and they would, yes, yeah, so we broke down in the middle of it. Um, the first time it happened, self-destructed, had no idea what had gone on. It was kind of like we were getting loads of locals sort of pulling at the bike curious sort of pulling at our pockets mm. seeing if we had anything and then the police got involved and they were whipping back the locals oh. and it was kind of this hokey cokey as they were going in and out trying to get close to us but the police were with them um, and then we realised we couldn't move it so we had to get it on the back of a police truck so we needed the help of all the locals to lift it and put it on it's quite a bizarre thing as well with sidecars or just certain countries because it's um, the vehicle was on the left hand side of the road in the UK mm-hmm. Obviously, it would be reversed in any other country driving the right-hand side. So a lot of countries, for some reason, they always thought the sidecar was the heaviest. Mm. So when picking it up, mm. everyone would go to the sidecar and leave mm. the bike. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> so when we were trying to put on this truck, I was left by myself lifting up the whole scooter and about mm. 15 Ethiopian guys all picking up the sidecar which yeah. is like a lion feather you could do it by yourself yeah. um, I was down the road just like blowing into a paper bag <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. but yeah but eventually we got to Gonda in Ethiopia after yeah quite a stressful 
truck journey um, and we were there for three weeks and it was because we were just literally waiting for a part to be delivered from the yeah. UK and, and then so from there we just started getting delivered clutches well in advance of when we thought it was going to blow up just to sort of mm. be on the safe side yeah another so. good tangent that one mate I thought you were going to go yeah. on. <laughs> <laughs> another, another three or four minutes just kind of random story I can't believe I did that I completely <laughs> forgot we were talking about <laughs> <laughs> going to the States <laughs> mm. that's where they, they say I don't know where those those last 500 kilometres went, Reese. <laughs> <laughs> what were we talking about again? <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's it. yeah, it's pretty much what happened most of the time. <laughs> okay, so we normally ask our guests um, if you could go back to your 18 year old self. But I think it's probably more interesting if you could go back to your pre round the world self. So you, you guys mm. with your. Uh, with your whiteboards in your um, shared accommodation with your grumpy American, <laughs> your rather cold American. Um, what advice would you give to them? Mm, that's a good question. Mm. I mean, I think one of the things, just don't put so much pressure on yourself, man. Yeah. We were definitely our biggest critics throughout yeah. the whole thing. I mm. um, think if I did something again now, I would just like chill out a bit because it was constant everything had to be perfect mm. like some of our first social would. media yeah, posts yeah. i mean we'd draft them for like days yeah. <laughs> not not exactly but it, we, everything was like we were always trying to and it is good obviously to try and do good stuff but we were yeah we were just trying to do too much we bit off more than we could chew in yeah. terms of like the charitable goals of the trip we were spending some yeah. evenings just literally sat down on our computers just researching charities in the area and emailing them and that's kind of I mean of course we had to chat most of it but at the same time you're just not even going and exploring where you actually are so yeah. it's kind of like you know mm. um, yeah so that's a good point yeah yeah we, and yeah I think just just don't worry about it so much we were just <laughs> constantly worrying about things in the early days mm -hmm. and then when we did get to Albania and sort of decided just to stop worrying about it everything mm. was a lot easier and those sort mm -hmm. of things happened a lot, a lot easier if I'm honest um, so that's probably what I'd say yeah, I probably agree. It's difficult as well, though, because I also I was thinking about that question in general because I knew eventually it would sort of come up. Mm -hmm. I also do kind of think that going back to pre-self and what uh, pre-trip and what advice I give myself like pre-trip, I'd, I'd give all sorts of advice. But mm -hmm. after the trip, I kind of think it, that's kind of what has brought me to now. If by making the sort of decisions that I made, and some mm -hmm. of them were silly and some of them not, in many ways I wouldn't have done the trip the way I'd done it had mm -hmm. I known the things I'd have known. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah. people always ask, um, as would you do it again? And the answer is absolutely no way on earth would I do that again. <laughs> <laughs> However, would I do it the first time round knowing what I know now? Without a doubt. So like mm. it's kind of like that, really, yeah. Mm. Yeah. So Yeah. Good advice. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> really, really fascinating story. So if anyone would like to look at a bit more of your blog posts and mm. pictures and the like, what's the best place to find you? Yeah, well, our website, www.asseenfromthesidecar.org, um, there's like an interactive map on there. You can click through uh, the, the route and stuff, and there's loads of really stupid videos um, you can watch on our YouTube channel too. Um, yeah. Basically, type as seen from the sidecar anywhere, and then we will come find up. You. No one else thinks to name themselves that. It's a really long winded name. So, <laughs> yeah. you type it, you'll find it. The, yeah. the domain name was, yeah, was, was not taken, thank you. Pretty easy to come by. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And uh, 2020, summer, there's a book coming along, we yeah. believe. Book yeah. and a film, yeah. Book that's what we're sort yeah. of working on, yeah. So, Excellent. hopefully, by next 2020 summer, yeah, yeah. We, we'll be um, good to go with that. And then, um, who knows, after that, maybe we think something, of something else. Stupid yeah. to do. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone says what's next. <laughs> we always say, like, we're just going to sit down for a bit. Yeah. Like, really Get yeah. the whiteboards out again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We'll have to just dust them off maybe yeah. next summer. Yeah. You still got them, yeah? Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> so, these were the opposite. We went to see Sir Ranulph Fiennes mm. earlier this year in, in Gateshead. Yeah. <laughs> it's like Ooh. the modern day equivalent. These yeah. Two. <laughs> wow. Yeah. I don't know about that. I'll take yeah. it. He really pushed some limits. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You still got all your fingers and toes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah exactly. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> we, yeah. yeah, we did think about just leaving a finger hanging out the sidecar yeah. just to come back and say, yeah. yeah. People like, don't know, understand how intense it is. We just leave one finger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One of us does it. Congratulations on not dying. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you ever yeah, so thank much. You. No, thank you. Thank so you so much for having us on, guys. Yeah, yeah, really good fun. Yeah. Awesome. awesome. Thanks. Cool. Thanks everyone for listening. Check out all the show notes at inspirationnorth.com. 
Join us again for the next episode when we'll be chatting to another inspirational person. If you like this, subscribe and tell your friends. If you didn't like this, subscribe anyway and tell everybody. <laughs>